chapter 5. I like that. That ties in. We're talking about thanking the Lord for saving me. Everybody say for saving me. Thank the Lord for saving me. Hallelujah. Saving me. David's, uh, remember, uh, the Bible says we are to draw joyously from the wells of salvation. Salvation is a wonderful thing. Paul said, I'm not ashamed. Remember over in 1 Romans 1, 16, 17, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Hallelujah. Of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. So we're going to talk about a little connection and salvation with what we're doing. We, we began last Wednesday night. I've had something I'm going to share on the, that I've mentioned that I'm going to get to when we have our Pack the House Sunday. I'm going to use more of an illustrated sermon that I'm going to do with it. The Lord kind of gave me while I was in Albania. And so, um, but I want to break it down and go in a little more detail here on Wednesday. So it may take us a few weeks and we'll just take our time. But we're talking about the title of what I'm um, ministering on here is called Me, Myself, and I. Now, somebody might say, well, that sounds kind of selfish. Well, it's really about man on three dimensions. Man on three dimensions. God created man to live on three dimensions. So, we just talk. So, you might not know it, but, but it's you, yourself, and you. <laughs> it's, uh, there's three parts to you. You're, you are a spirit. You have a soul, and you live in a body. And it's good to keep that in mind. I am a spirit. I have a soul, and I live in a body. And the Lord really just um, surprisingly, because when things come and you know you're supposed to get on something, it's just like, wow, you know, and then the revelation, even, gosh, this year, revelation in my life, I don't know about yours, but my revelation in my life has just been amazing. It's like, where have I been the last 30 years? So, but part of that's we're seeking him and, you know, praying for revelation. Remember Paul, Paul praying for the Ephesians, you know, if we remember you have, to, just like, remember I said, you have to ask Jesus. Jesus said, ask for things. You have to ask for revelation. It's not just going to happen automatically. You have to ask him, Lord, show me. I mean, if Moses hadn't said, Lord, I, I need more. Show me your glory. He would have never got that special sight, seeing the Lord walk by and the Lord pronounce his name, the Lord, you know. But, but he asked. And there's just some stuff you got to ask for. And there's other times God just does it. And you weren't really asking. You just had a relationship and you're talking to him, and man, all of a sudden, he just kind of hits you with something. You're like, whoo, thank you, Lord, you know. But, but we're supposed to ask. Yeah. We're supposed to ask. James says, you have not because you ask not. Remember James? Dr. James? He said, you have not because you ask not. And sometimes you ask with wrong motives. So, it's, so the word helps you ask, right? Because Jesus said in John 15, if you abide in me, verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you will, and it shall be given. That's a pretty good promise right there. So uh, asking is important. And Paul in Ephesians 1 said he, he prayed that God would give us and grant the church at that point, the church at Ephesus, give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of our understanding enlightened. And we actually preached last year, I don't remember, last year or so, we, we preached a series called Eyes and Ears. You have spiritual eyes and you have spiritual ears. So that was really good stuff. I went through some of that and I was like, Wow. But um, so I just said there's so much revelation and all of a sudden the Lord kind of was dealing with me about on, a, on just an aspect of what I had been teaching a lot on Wednesday nights and some on Sundays here. And I got to Albania and all of a sudden I was just really seeing some things and I broke it down in, in connection with spirit, soul, and body. And, um, and, and this is a big area and I realized, uh, and then I was listening to something that Dad Hagen was preaching. Uh, and he said, the greatest need in the body of Christ is to renew our minds. And I get it because uh, when you break down the spirit, soul, and the body, um, you realize, you know, I am a spirit. And so we're teaching on the fact that when you get born again, your spirit man was totally complete. But nothing, nothing else changed in you. Your, your, your body didn't change and your mind didn't change. I mean, I like to say, you know, if, if, you, were, if you were a pretty good cusser out in the world and you got born again, you probably still going to slip a few times. I mean, it's funny. I was listening to a friend of mine the other day. He's preaching, and, and he, he prophetically, he called out a, a healing in this guy. He said, it's like, it's like somebody, somebody hit you in the calf with a, with a, with a two before. And the man in the crowd goes, damn! That's me! <laughs> Sorry, I was just, he said it, not me. I was just repeating. 
<laughs> but everybody went, wah! You know, we get so religious in church, you know. And, uh, <laughs> but the guy was like, man, that's exactly what happened to me. And the guy got healed. But he was, <laughs> so I was cracking up, you know, but, uh, man, <laughs> how do I get off on all that? Uh, spirit, soul, and body, <laughs> cussing, yeah, so, so, <laughs> thank you, uh, I'm glad you're listening. So, uh, so I said, sometimes people get saved and, and their mind is still, you know, they didn't get, their mind's not renewed, I mean, you know, but, so, so there's things that we have to work on, right? And so, uh, anyway, so I, I was thinking, I was this Brother Hagin, he said the most important thing is for, for the body of Christ is people to renew their minds. And, well, I know that. We know that. And, but in, sometimes you see it in light of what God's trying to show you. And you say, wow, okay, I see that. And that's what's hindering people from being able to find the will of God or be sensitive to God and so forth and no promises or whatever. And so, he um, says, I kept looking at that and I really, so I think it'll really be an eye-opener on Packed House Sunday, by the way. So, but, but we're breaking it down a little more detail. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 says, Now may the God of peace. Everybody say the God of peace. That is another, that, th- that word peace has been another part of the revelation. This, if you've been here on Wednesday nights, I mean, I preached on, uh, you know, get rid of the frogs. And a uh, couple of Wednesday nights, get rid of the frogs. Anybody remember that? Get rid of the frogs. And then, and then a couple of messages right after that about peace. And peace has been, that's been a whole other concept in light of just one thing. One, God said one thing to me that just opened up. It's like a prism of things. And I'm just like, man. And it's been a blessing for me personally. But peace is another one of those things that, man, how important is peace? We're talking about Jesus Sunday morning, he's the prince of peace. And, and, um, but he said, my peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. And, and really, God wants us. That peace is, is, is what God wants for our homes. If we don't have peace in our homes, we ain't doing it right. Peace. The shalom really got on that word, shalom. Nothing missing, nothing broken. What a powerful Old Testament word for the peace of God. And, and uh, God is a God of peace. And so you'll always, have to, you'll always have to challenge the things that threaten your peace. you got to challenge it. There's something threatening your peace. Peace of mind, peace, trying to get a, the peace of your finances. Not, not peace, P-E-A-C-E, peace, a piece of your finances and it's bothering you. you got to get that peace back, you know. And, uh, but peace and Jesus, man, talked so much about peace and and the fruit of the Spirit, and people have lost. These days, people are experiencing a lack of peace. So things robbing us of our peace and our joy. And, and so, but anyway, that's a, so, so God wants us to be in peace. And so now may the God of peace. I, I just think about how sometimes we just forget he is a God of peace. He's not a God of confusion. And how we're led. How, what's the number, one of the main ways we're led? Well, we know we're led by the Spirit, but, but the Spirit's the Spirit of peace. And he's going to lead you in peace. He's going to guide you in peace. And when you cast your cares and your anxiety upon the Lord, and, and you, he said he'll, that peace will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So there's an element of peace that's just dynamic. When you're in trouble, when Jesus was on the, I don't know, I'm just flowing here. When Jesus was on that boat and the storm is raging and disciples are freaking out, and Jesus gets, gets up and says, peace. Spoke peace to it. We have to speak peace sometimes. You have to just say peace. I had four kids this time. We just peace right now. Uh, I'm fitting. I'm fitting anyway. <laughs> so, so here we go. So may the God of peace Himself. Now notice, sanctify you entirely. So here, here, here's the breakdown. And may your spirit and soul and body, spirit, and he didn't. He, he didn't use it in a different uh, f- sequence. This is the right sequence because this. It's the most important, spirit, soul, and body. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved, complete, without blame, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, again, we, in, last week we kind of got into it that we, we've been created in the likeness and image of God. And God is a spirit. God also has emotions. So, there's, there's an element of God. He's, he's got emotions. He's got feelings. He's grieved. He's, he's happy. Hallelujah. He, he's pleased. And the New Testament tells us we should 
find out what pleases him so we can try to do that on a regular basis. And Jesus basically said, I always do what pleases the Father, so he never leaves me. So obviously, if we're not doing what he likes, maybe he's kind of like, uh, I mean, he doesn't turn away from us. He loves us. But the Spirit is grieved. The Holy Spirit can be grieved. How many understand you can grieve the Holy Spirit? So, uh, when God created man, he created Adam, he created him to live on three different dimensions. And we really got into that a little bit more about the spirit. We'll touch a little bit more about that. But the first dimension we talked about was the spiritual dimension. Spiritual dimension, all right? John 4, 24, Jesus said, God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And again, we said that word worship is our connection. How do you connect with God? You connect spiritually. You don't, you don't touch God with your mind. Yes, you think, and you meditate and so forth, but, but that, when that gets down on the inside of you, now you're connected, and you're getting some revelation, and you're, you get it in you so it becomes you. You're not just trying to do it. You just become it. You think it. It becomes automatic for you. You walk in love. I don't have to think about, well, should I walk in love? Or this person just cut me off, and maybe you used to quick to like, but now you're like, bless them, Lord. You know, just, you, when you start getting to where that just flows like that, just like, that, that's the way the word's supposed to work. You just, you don't react, you respond with a platform of response, and you speak the word and so forth. And so, we connect with God through our spirit. That's how we're going to connect. We're going to connect with him. We worship him. And so, we said our number one mission is to feed our spirit. That, that, is, that is your number one mission is you have to feed your spirit. So, then we'll, how do, we'll talk about, how, well, how are you going to do that? Well, that's where the word comes in. Feeding your spirit with what is spirit. Jesus said, my word is spirit and life. My words are spirit. They're life. It's truth. So, so we said this, and we'll kind of just catch up and just kind of picking up where we left off. We grow our spirit. We renew our minds, and we control our bodies. That's basically, so God created Adam to live in these three dimensions. His bo- with his body, he, c- he was connected to the physical world. You can't walk in this world without a body. I mean, it's kind of like a space suit. You can't, go to, you can't go land on the moon and get out on the moon without a space suit. So really, our body is like our suit. We talked about it, Romans 12.1. We, we, it's, it's, our, it's our offering. Jesus said, a body in Hebrews 4, thou, a body that has given me. Jesus couldn't go to the cross without a body. He couldn't suffer without a body. And so he felt it when he's in the garden. Right? What was he feeling? Sweating drops of blood. Enough. When's the last time you sweat drops of blood? That's some pressure. Yeah. Phew, right? So... With his body and with our bodies, we connect with the physical world. And, uh, and, I, and I mentioned too, with our bodies, part of that, God wants us to enjoy the physical world. Meaning, he gives us all, richly, all things to enjoy. God wants us to, you know, he wants us to enjoy life. Jesus said, I came to give you life and life abundantly and, and to experience good things and be victorious over the bad things. Praise the Lord. So, with our bodies, we, we get to enjoy the world. And then we connect with others through our soulish realm, all right? Or we interact with each other. And so the soul is our mind, will, and emotion. So we've, we've got a spirit, we have a soul, and we have a body. And with our soul, again, you could break that soul down, which is what we're going to look at on that Pack the House Sunday. Our soul is our mind, our will, and our emotions. And they all affect how we relate either to the body or to the spirit. Because Jesus said the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So you got to figure out what you're going to do right here because this guy is going to make the deciding vote. And if you don't renew your mind, you're going to be over here a whole lot. And you're going to be living over here or here emotionally, I'm, I'm responding to all the circumstances of life and the troubles and, 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 and I'm up and I'm down and, and I feel depressed and, and nobody loves me. And you hear the devil a lot more right here than living in that fullness. Hallelujah. So, um, John chapter 3, let's go back. We kind of touched a little bit of this, but I want you to see this because I want you to see how important something is. Uh, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. Nicodemus, he's a ruler of the Jews. Everybody say ruler of the Jews. So this is an important guy, a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you've come from God as a teacher. All right, so he's, he's acknowledging something. First of all, he get the picture. He's sneaking over to Jesus in the night. 
he, he's, a, he's a ruler of the Jews, and he doesn't want anybody to know, I'm going to talk to Jesus. So he's sneaking over. And Lord, he said, we know you've come from God as a teacher for no one. Now watch this. No one can do these signs that you do unless God's with him. So he's, he said, obviously, there's some things going on here. Signs. He calls them signs. So that means, that means sign meaning people's wondering. Signs make you wonder. Probably some limbs growing out, blind eyes opening, devils getting cast out. And Jesus answered and said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom. Unless you're born again. And so the most important message basically Jesus preached, if you look at it, was that people are going to be born again after I do my redemptive work. That's what he's trying to tell Nicodemus. The most important thing here is that people are going to get born again when I'm finished doing what I came to do. And he's explaining this to this Jew Jewish ruler. And so Nicodemus in verse 4 says to him, well, how can a man be born when he's old? He can't enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit. Now, water meaning really is a type of the word, the water, the water of the word. Remember Ephesians 5, Paul's talking about that husbands will... Present it, you know, washing, the washing of the water, the word, and so forth. And, and so the, the water's like, the word is like water. Spirit's like water. So he's talking about the water and the spirit. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Then he says in verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now, get that phrase right there, born of the spirit. Born of the spirit is spirit. When you got born again, you were born of the spirit. So that means some, there was something spiritual taking place. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. Have you ever talked to somebody and you said that you kind of use that phrase born again and they look at you like a cow at a new gate? Born again? What's born again? I mean, you don't really, sometimes you don't hear that phrase a lot in churchianity. Born again. What does it mean to be born again? Well, it means your spirit got totally transformed, changed. And so Jesus is telling Nicodemus, this is my plan. This is my mission. This is why I came. And Nicodemus is wanting to talk about miracles, and Jesus is wanting to talk about something greater, which is the new birth, people being born again. And the new birth is what fixes all the problems of mankind. That's all we said last week. God had to fix. The number one thing God had to fix was man's spirit because that's what got separated from God. When he sinned, and he, he, he was totally separated from God. And something that Jesus says later over in John, in John 14, 12. Now watch this. Remember, a lot of people know John 14, 12. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, will he also, he'll do also. And greater works than these will he do because I go to the Father. Now think about that one. Greater works than Jesus? Well, what we have to understand is there were three things that had to happen in order for this to take place. Number one, the crucifixion. Number two, the resurrection. And number three, the ascension, meaning Jesus said, I'm going to the Father. I'm going so I can send the Holy Spirit, and you're going to be able to do the works that I do, and even greater. But the big thing that he's talking about, the things that we'll be able to do and the works that are greater, is you have to understand nobody, everybody say nobody, Nobody got saved during Jesus' time on the earth. Nobody. Nobody got saved. Nobody was born again during Jesus' earthly ministry. It couldn't happen until Jesus ascended to heaven to become the high priest of the new covenant. It was impossible. Because that's what Jesus came to do. His final place was ascending and becoming high priest of the new covenant. And he is a, he's the high priest... He's the apostle and high priest, this new covenant, and this covenant is based on better promises. Jesus, the guarantee of a better covenant. And so, that couldn't happen until that. So, understand something. When Adam sinned, there was no longer a connection. Remember that spirit connection? When he, when he sinned, God said, when you eat that, when you eat that tree, you're going to die. And it, he did. We looked at that. And so there was no mediator between him and God. Everybody say, no mediator. So now that man has sinned, he basically forfeited his, his authority, his dominion. Now Satan's got it. 
and he's separated from God, and God has to drive him out of the garden. I mean, I, mean, I, I, could, I bet the boy had heel marks. Those angels were taking him out of the garden. They didn't want to go. And, and, a, and an angel is guarding the entrance to, to, that's what it says right there in Genesis. And they're probably looking like, where are we supposed to go now? But they, but they lost that connection with God spiritually. And then it began to, it took a while, it affected their body, but, but there was no mediator between him and God. And so Jesus is the mediator. Now watch this now. How important is Jesus? He's the mediator that keeps us connected with God. He's the one. The Bible says through him we offer up the sacrifice of praise, giving thanks and praise. Through him, in 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 him, and in him, and in him. And all over 113 New Testament in him scriptures in the New Testament. In him, through him, by him. We have access. Are you following me here? So, he's our connection. His blood is for us when we miss it. Talks about his blood. The Bible says in 1 John 1, and if we, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to cleanse us, forgive us. And it's his blood that was shed. So, his blood keeps us connected. So, the, the recreation of the human spirit, think about it, it's the greatest miracle that can happen. Now, we have to change our adjustment because... I'm convinced right now the church is not getting something, maybe not just ours, but I'm talking about sometimes the church in general. General, we, we think salvation is just kind of, oh, well, if they want it or it's, Paul said it's the power of God unto salvation, the gospel. And we have to understand, we have to get fired up about seeing some people saved, just sharing our faith. Whether they respond or not or think you're a goofball or what, you know what, just but you understand, man, this is, this is power. I mean, Jesus says we got to snatch some people out of the fire. And we have to, we have to get so unconsumed with our own self and life that we're wish willing to, Lord, just, okay, I'm asking you, lead me by somebody. Just be, I'm going to be a light. Show me somebody. Because the Lord wants people to get saved. He's not willing that any should perish. So he's bound to help us reach people. But we don't really understand that salvation is what Jesus is really talking about. This is the greatest thing. If you, you get somebody saved, you did greater work than Jesus could do because he could never get anybody saved because he had to go to heaven first. So you talk about greater works. Salvation is the greatest work that could ever be done on this planet. Greater, salvation is greater. Somebody getting born again is greater than a miracle. It's greater than, than somebody's blind eyes opening, ears opening, foot growing out, whatever. Just the gift of salvation because it so completely changes a person on the inside that that old man is gone. Man, I'm having fun. I don't know if y'all getting anything out here. This is blessing me. So, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Let's look at it. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, well, are you in Christ? Well, if you're born again, you're in him. In Christ. Man, that's so powerful. If you're in him, there ain't nothing of the devil should be in you. Okay, that went over real big. I said if you're in him, whether that's sickness, stuff of the world, whatever. But we're working on that. That's why, that's why this soul, that's why this soul man is so important, this renewal part here. Because everywhere you see in the Bible when it's connected so many times with the soul, it's the renewal. It's the restoration of the soul. All right? So, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. Everybody say new creature. Greek literally says a new species of being that never existed before. Never existed before. Brand new. And you got to just get up in the morning, look in the mirror and say, you are brand new. And the good part is you're not aging either. That new you, it's going to be the same. You can't see it because you got that body. <laughs> we got that body, right? So, so the old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. What came? That new you, that new man, that new creature in Christ Jesus. That never, listen, we, we don't get, it's hard, it's hard to put our brain around it. That something happened on the inside of us that was totally old and we got some, we became somebody brand new. Because we still look the same on the outside. <laughs> I mean, I don't get it. I don't know. But I don't have to. I just believe it. Whatever God says, okay. But we were made brand new on the inside. Brand new person. I mean, 
That's what he's saying. With the nature of God. With that nature. God's nature. Now you know why the devil hates your guts. Yeah, he don't like you. You look like God. Maybe he sees that spirit man. I don't know. But he, he knows who we are. He is a spirit. I mean, he's a spirit. Yeah. Principalities and power. That's, we talked about last week. That's, there's a spiritual world. We can't see it, but it's real. It's more real than this natural world. Because somehow, some way, at some point, it's all going to be the same. And we're going to go, and we'll be judging angels. Man. It's interesting. And Paul said, though the outward man perish, the inward man is renewed day by day. 2 Corinthians 4. Five. So, let's keep going here. So, our bodies are not new. We, we mentioned that. Our, our minds are not new. We still have the same knowledge that we had before. I mean, when you got born again, you didn't all of a sudden know. You did, I, mean, I mean, you get born again, and if you didn't know where Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, or, or Joshua was, you're having trouble. Right? And a lot of people are like, I don't know where to turn. I don't, where is that? Well, you're going to have to put some effort to find out who Paul was and who Peter was. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, this is, this is, it's, it's kind of like when uh, Vince Lombardi would hold up the, hold up a football with the Green Bay Packers, professional athletes. He said, guys, this is a football. Sometimes you want to hold it up and say, everybody, this is the Bible. It's God's word talking to you. Amen. You got to dig around in there. And so, Praise the Lord. It's our spirit that, that is completely changed, totally changed. So here's literally what happened. Let me wind this down. He, this is literally what happened. Because the Bible tells us we were crucified with Christ. Let me understand that. Well, let me give you a difference because everybody, a lot of people know Galatians 2.20. Let me give you another one. Romans chapter 6, verse 6. Romans 6, 6 says, knowing this. Well, well we got to know this right here. Knowing this. Knowing what? That our old self was crucified. With, everybody say the old self. So that, that being, whatever was in that spirit, soul, and by that being. That, let me just say something about that. that per, just because it's dead, dead without Christ. You're not, not, so in other words, if you're not born again, even though that spirit man is dead, mean, it's dead meaning it's separated from God. Doesn't mean that it wasn't existing or not existing. That's why there are people in the world that get over into the demonic, the magic and, and stuff like that, hypnot- I, I, ain't nobody going to hypnotize me. I, I mean, that's, that's some dangerous stuff. And if you've ever had any of that and you yielded to some of that, you should repent and say, no, I'll repent of that. Forgive me, Lord Jesus, for allowing that or what happened because you don't want to give the devil access. But, but people do that with Ouija boards and tarot cards and zodiac signs. No, that's all, I mean... Those, those might have been good at one point, but people use them to, if you use them to guide your life, you're wrong. They are not to guide your life. They don't tell you who you are. Oh, well, I'm a, I'm a Taurus. No, you're stupid. That's what you are. You're just telling everybody. Boy, I'm really going at it tonight. I'm having fun right now. Man, I'm a Leo. Well, we'll stop on that one. <laughs> And, you know, and people are sincere. I'm, I'm, I'm not being hard. They're, people are sincere, but sincerely wrong. <laughs> right. You can't, you know. And so we, we've run into them. And you're trying to help people. You just got to help people. But no, you're, you're who God made you to be, right? How did I get off on all that? Man, we were crucified. That old self. The old self. So I was talking about that spirit. Even though that spirit, sometimes I forget where I'm going. Even though that spirit was, is separated from God, it can still function in the wrong dimension of darkness. Do you understand that? That's where I was going with that. It can function in darkness. That's how you have witch doctors. And I, I mean, I, I've, been, I was, uh, I've been to Haiti, and, uh, and I've, I've been in places, and sometimes you can, the darkness is thick. You know, they practice, they practice that stuff, and they do curses on people. And then some people, ooh, you know what? No, if you know who you are, you're like, well, they ain't going to curse me. But the stuff's real. And people that don't know, don't know who they are in Christ, they'll yield to that stuff and, and let it tear them up. I mean, it's, it's amazing to me because when I go to Albania, it's really a big deal. 
And I realized even this last trip, they, there's people coming to counseling. We did, you know, and they, they, uh, people do curses and stuff like that. And I'm just like, that's just foreign to me. I'm like, wow, you know, they have to deal with that kind of stuff. And, this, and it's demonic, and it actually works on the demonic side of things. So I just said all that, say, just because we're talking about, you know, when we get born again, now we're alive. Well, you were still, your spirit man was alive, but it was just separated from God. No connection with God. It's there. And that's how people do stuff, even, even supernaturally, I guess is a good way to put it, in the dark side. Sound like we're talking about Star Wars, right? <laughs> so, so the old self was crucified in order that our body of sin, now notice, our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. See, that's the breakthrough. Because even though I'm, if I'm separated from God, I, I'm not born again, I'm a slave to sin. It, 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 uh, a slave's a slave. It, it uh, overpowers me. I can't, you know, it's like I have no power over it. Whereas when you get born again, sin has no power over you. It cannot control you. And that's what Paul's telling us. He who has died is freed from sin. No control. Because now I have a nature of God. I have this new born again spirit in me. So this is, that's what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 16, 24, when he said, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. What does that mean? People think, well, you know, ooh, got, ooh, got my cross. Got to low, I got to carry my cross. Listen, Jesus didn't stay on the cross. And you don't stay on the cross. We don't, we're not, it's not a picture of I'm, I'm, I'm staying on my cross. No, it means you went to the cross. You died with him. Now you're free. Now live his plan. Walk in his way. That's what it means to follow him. Not what well, I'm just hanging on the cross. <laughs> All right? So... Your old man, your old man goes to the, went to the cross with Jesus. I mean, the Bible teaches that. And, and, but you get raised up as a new man in Christ. You, you don't see yourself, I'm just carrying my cross. No, you need to see yourself as sitting on the throne with Jesus. I'm seated in heavenly places. Paul didn't say, well, I'm just carrying my cross. No, he said, I am seated in heavenly places, far above all principality, power, rule, and dominion, and authority. I'm not carrying my cross. No, that, that just simply means... Where your will and his will meet, where they cross, that's where you're going to have a a connection. So Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. We know that. And it's no longer I who lives, but it's Christ that's living in me. Wow, think about that. Now, it's not just my new person, but now if I yield to the point where now it is actually Jesus living in me. Go figure. Jesus living in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, in this body, I have to live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So what does that mean? That means I'm going to have to deal with my flesh. I'm going to have to crucify it daily in a sense, but my spirit man was made alive with Christ. Meaning I'm going to have to make choices, and sometimes i got to go back to the cross and say, this is not my life. I was crucified with Christ. So we're no longer slaves to sin. And, and here's the deal. The devil has no power over us. You remember Hebrews 2.14? It says, therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death. That is the devil. So that's how God fixes our sin problem. Jesus went to pay for our debts, redeem us, make us righteous, And so now, the new birth is God's crowning point of grace. Salvation. God's crowning point of grace. That's why everybody knows Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God. Everybody say the gift of God. Verse 9, not as a result of works, so that anyone can boast. Listen to that in, uh, this is the 26th translation. It was nothing you could or did achieve. Nothing you could or did achieve. It was God's grace which saved you. It's not your own doing. The gift is God's. It hasn't been earned so that no one can boast of it. It means there's nothing you could do. You say, why is that so important? Well, salvation is the greatest gift. 
Man, this is the greatest gift. Think about that. The greatest gifts. And here's what here's what's, I think parents need to really, I mean, if you have kids and when they, if they get saved, and we did, you have to, you, you need to make, they need to know. Like if they're young, because here's the deal. A lot of parents don't realize when, when, when a, the best time for a person to get saved is when they're young. But, you know, we kind of thinking, oh, or like children's church and the kids, because I've told Elizabeth the other day, I said, man, if you have new kids coming in, if we have visitors and those kids, I said, you, you give an altar call. You, you do everything you can to get them saved if they're not saved. Because we don't know how long, if they're, how many, if they're coming back. But you can get them saved. But we kind of think, oh, well, getting kids saved is not that important because well, there's not this big fanfare. You know, they don't have this big past. And so there's not a lot of, woo, you know, and I have this life in my past and I got this testimony now. And it's just kind of like, oh, I'm a kid and I hadn't lived that long, but, but I got saved. But I said all that, say, when, when your kids really understand they got saved, you need to make a big deal about it. They got saved this. This is when you got saved. So they grew up knowing, I got saved right here. I got saved in that church or that day. And it's, it's like, it's planted. I got saved. Because it's that important. Salvation is important. And you know, maybe you can think back, well, I, I really know when maybe a turnaround happened or I really, I really saw that. That's, that's the most important day in your history. <laughs> that was, that's B, your B.C. moment. Was before, now I'm A.D. No. Mm-mm. Treat it like they received the greatest gift on the planet. Think about salvation like that. It's the greatest gift on the planet. Greatest thing they could ever receive. Because why? Now their eternal, their eternal destiny is set. Now they follow it out. They can walk it out. And you don't play it down like, like it's no big deal. And, and, it's, and really, this is like all, with all big projects, all projects of God, the, the greatest miracles all come at the beginning. Have you ever noticed that about God? I mean... That's what God does with us when we're born again. It seems like when some of the greatest things, you know, that happen early on is when you first get born again. And man, God just like did this and he did that. And that's what with the children of Israel, I mean, when they first, they, he, man, Pharaoh and all that. Think of all the mighty things that happen. And then they, get in, they finally get into the promised land. And now they got to walk by faith. And they got to possess. But you see these miracles. A lot of good stuff happens. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And some good things happen to you early on. Man, you're like, whoo, man. And then you're wondering, where did God go? He said, you got to walk by faith now, (laughs) right? And in order to walk out God's plan, people have to be delivered. So that's why sometimes there's a miraculous thing. Man, people get delivered, like boom, and they're like, man, I want some more of that. And God said, no, you got to walk by faith. That's just, I said, you got set free. You got to jump start. Now you got to walk. Now you got to go. Hallelujah. And so now in closing here, we've been given a platform. This is my last verse. So everybody say a platform. What do you mean a platform? Well, now that we're saved by grace, can't boast about it. It came from God. Now we have a platform, Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship. Greek word is literally his poem. You can come up, Jensen. His poem. It's the, word, it's the Greek word poeme. It's where we get the word poem. Everybody say poem. So you can say it like this. I'm God's poem. Nobody else got the same poem. I'm his workmanship. Think about it. Created, one translation, recreated, just created in Christ Jesus for good works. Now, why did God save you? For good works. He has a plan. Recreated. Which God prepared. Now, these good works, God's prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. And I love the, tra- um, Amplified is my favorite on this. He says, he says that, that, you know, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, plans that God's prearranged, made ready ahead of time for us to walk in, living the good life. That's what I like, living the good life. But a lot of people think, you know, they have to do good things first. You know, so many thought processes a lot of people have is, well, I got to clean my life up before I go to church. You ever heard that one before? Well, I, I, need, to, I need to get my life right, or I don't want to be a hypocrite. You know, I, don't, I just, I, I just kind of need to get some things right in my life before I, before I start, you know, really trying to live for, you know, go to church. You can't do it. It's impossible. You cannot clean your own life up first. It'll never happen because you don't have the power within yourself to, to, to do it. It's impossible. You can never clean your life up enough. But, but here's the deal. We start doing good things because we're saved. 
Not because we're trying to get saved or we want to get saved. You don't do good things because I want to get saved. No, you start doing good things after you get saved. Because that's the power of salvation. So again, the 26th translation says, For he has made us what we are because he has created us through our union with Christ Jesus for doing good deeds, which God prepared beforehand to be the employments of our life. I like that. To be the employments of our life. So I'm employed to do good deeds, but I'm not doing it to earn something. I'm just saved. And I'm doing it because I've been given something. What have I been given? Stand up. The greatest gift. The greatest gift. We have received the greatest gift that could ever be given. Greater than any healing. Greater than eyes open. Greater, I mean, so you could just say, I'm a walking miracle. <laughs> now, if you don't feel good about that, man, I'm a walking miracle. Come on, that's just good to declare. I'm a walking miracle. Now, because you're a walking miracle, guess what? Miracles still happen. You, stuff will still happen in your life. You're a continual miracle in the process. Hallelujah. Good things taking place. So, Lord, we thank you tonight. Thank you. Come on, just thank him for salvation right now. Jesus said, don't rejoice that the demons are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Your names. But that's just, he just simply said, you, if you can't rejoice about anything else, you just, number one, start with the fact that you're saved. That's a good place to just say, I am saved. Hallelujah. The gift. The gift. The gift. The gift. The gift of salvation. It's precious. It's valuable. And we need to tell people, you need to be born again. Are you born again? Just be bold. Are you born again? Are you saved? Are you saved? Are you born again? Hallelujah. And now maybe you can explain it a little bit. It just simply means, you know what? God died for you, loves you, cares about you. Praise the Lord. So, Father, we just thank you. Thank you tonight, Lord, for saving us, redeeming us, calling us by name. You have a wonderful plan for us. Hallelujah. So, Lord, we just love you tonight. We thank you. Thank you for the gift of salvation. You said, whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord, they'll be saved. Hallelujah. And then you told us in Philippians, now work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Walk, walk it out. Work it out. Work it out. For he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. And it is he who is in you to will and to work for his good pleasure. Come on, just rest on that one. He is in me to will and to work for his good pleasure. Hallelujah. Well, did you learn anything tonight? A few of you did. Praise the Lord. All right. Let's make, no, I'm playing. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, if you love, how many of you love the Lord? Yeah. Just help you just a little bit more here to see that we're talking about the spirit man. Does it get much better than that right there? And that's going to begin to affect everything else. So, amen. Well, bless you guys. Have a wonderful night. Amen. And uh, we'll see you. Don't forget to invite somebody Sunday morning. You're dismissed.